So you take the pie and you pie him in the face. <laughs> He's sitting on the chair. <laughs> you go, ha ha, you worthless piece of shit. He's so, why are you so rude? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm quite aware of addiction and mental health. I think I'm a very woke dominatrix. <laughs> We're here with V. Hello. Hello. I've been looking forward to this podcast for fucking ever. <laughs> We've been talking about this for weeks. And uh, what's your, well, fuck it. What's your profession? Um, I'm V, and I'm a dominatrix. See how I put myself in danger for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to be scared of. I feel like you're lulling me into sub- submission. Oh, <laughs> I don't kind of like this. I feel uncomfortable right now. Why? It's nothing to be uncomfortable about. There is nothing to be uncomfortable about. Uh, no, okay, so let's stop fucking around. So, you're a dominatrix. Yes. Um, how long have you been doing that for? I've been doing it for seven years now, on right. and off. I mean, six years, a lot, and then the last year I've kind of pulled away from it. You've pulled away from being a dominatrix? Before, I used to do it a lot more frequently, and then a year ago I had to focus on, I set up a separate business, so I put all my time into that. But yeah. still involved in the scene, like going to parties, events, being out there, but just not as frequently as before. What actually does a dominatrix do? So there are different branches if you work in the dom world. I work with men who want to be humiliated um, submissive in all sorts of different ways. So adult babies, adult pets, men who like to be smoke, you smoke a cigarette in their face, use their mouth as an ashtray, that kind of stuff. Oh, you my know, God. Um, tying people up, spanking them, whipping them. Yeah. A lot of uh, pay pigs. I don't know if you know right. what that is. All right, V, we're going to have to slow the fuck down, right? <laughs> You're, you're assuming Sorry. a lot of our. You're assuming a lot of our. Like I was going to say clientele. That's that's your phrase. Uh, a lot of our viewership or listenership have sex lives. Uh, I'm pretty sure they don't, right? So let's explain. All right, let's go through it one by one. Adult babies. So people who like to dress up as a baby. It's a very infantile, regressive submission where. I either I or they are dressed up as a baby, so they'll have like an adult nappy on, um, an adult bib, dummies, right. and then they sit on the floor and go goo goo gaga and pretend to be a baby. And then I usually feed them with an adult bottle, burp them. Obviously, they don't actually need burping. <laughs> <laughs> Fake burping. Then they sometimes cry, so I have to calm it down. Um, I'll be like, it's okay, don't worry. It's very maternal, so that kind of role is making sure that they're well looked after. Yeah. But then if they're naughty, they get punished. <laughs> okay, well, oh my God. And how do they get punished? Usually just like a gentle slap. Or depending on what they ask for. So a lot of my clients, every client that I meet, we usually have an email or phone discussion and we go through the scenario that we want to do. Um, I'd say 90% of the time it's, we have like a vague script of what's going to happen and the rest of the time it's improvised. Clients that I've seen more than a few times, we kind of know exactly what we're going to do or they ask me to come up with stuff on the spot and surprise them. (laughs) Okay. Um, but yeah, the punishment is usually some sort of physical punishment right. or taking their dummy away or their bottle away, which is really sad because then they just cry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, and then the pet play, no, what, what did you say it was? Um, adults who dress up as, as puppies. How do you dress up as a puppy? You can get latex. Well, you it doesn't have to be latex, but... Uh, I don't know if you've seen, there's been some documentaries on you can get outfits to dress up as an animal, so as a little dog or a cat. Oh, furries. Is that what? Yeah. Furries. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, shit. Um, I'm revealing too much about myself here now. He knows more than me. (laughs) 
No, no, no. You know I've, the actual term for it. Yeah, and yeah. Because I've seen some YouTube videos about it. YouTube videos, YouTube videos on it, and yeah, that's what they were, were calling yeah, it right. for, for furries and shit. So yeah, adult pets that some of them like to be kept in a cage, others like to be taken out for a walk. So if I go, to, I used to go to a lot of events. There's a lot of events in London that are sub dumb related where the women are dominant and the men are obviously submissive and you can take them on yep. a lead and walk them around the event and they're your pet for the night right and so they do the same as a dog or a cat where they're like give them milk and they lick it up from the floor <laughs> <laughs> What? I'm trying. I am trying so hard. Not this is to, a serious conversation. I know. I know. I'm trying so hard not to kink shame people and offend you, but I'm going to struggle so much. You need to have an open mind. I know. I know. But fucking, I've just got an image of you leading somebody around on a leash and then licking up a puddle of like milk or other things. Oh fuck <laughs> me! Wait, wait. I'm, I, went, I went into that. Do you have to like train him like you would a dog? Like if it pisses yeah, on the floor, you have to put training. You get treats. You get rewards. Positive reinforcement. Oh my god! So there's stuff. a whole like psychology behind it. Yeah, it's treating them as an animal, as a pet. But do they get like sexual gratification from it? Yes, sometimes. I know that they've got sexual gratification and depending on the scenario, if they are turned on, they can get in trouble for that. So she's talking about erections here, people. Yeah. If you get turned on, then you might get a beat down from me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what, uh, this is, this is amazing. This is amazing. Cause you're like such an unassuming woman, right? Like you're like quite tiny and it's like, you, so how do you, how, what does a beat down entail? It depends. Whipping, caning, slapping. Um, a lot of a lot of the things that turn people on are to do with shame and humiliation. So if you're at an event and there's a room full of people, you go, you've been a really bad boy, down boy, or you like hit them in front of a load of people watching. It's humiliating, right? You yeah. don't want to be told off in a group of people. So they get off on that most of the time. So I do that. Yeah. Sometimes it's they've asked me to do that, so they've said I'm going to misbehave and you're going to do this. And then other times, they can't help themselves and they get turned on, and then I have to tell them off. So, Absolutely amazing. Um, yeah. So let's backtrack here a little bit from the actual specifics. How did you get into it? I got into it by <laughs> I met a girl who used to do it, and she got me into it. I. I just moved to London. I'm from the West Midlands. Didn't really know what I was doing. Was really interested in the kink and fetish scene. And I, I've always kind of thrown myself into things. So she suggested it to me. And the reason why it was such a a thing for me, the reason why I wanted to get into it and why it was appealing was that there's not a lot of South Asian women who are in that world, especially British South Asian women. Yeah. And I think there was a lot of rebellion as well because I'd come from a really strict background where you don't talk about sex, you don't talk about kink, you don't talk about any of that. Yeah. So that that was part of why it was so alluring to me. I wanted to get into it. Also, I'm really interested in the psychology behind kink and sex. So she mentioned it to me and it kind of went from there and I worked through adult work so plug I plug plug are you still on there no not on there anymore oh, okay. cool. but i used it for six years mm -hmm. so i built a profile on there but my whole thing was you're not going to believe this but the girl next door dom so the girl that doesn't dress up as a dominatrix the girl doesn't sound like a dominatrix because mm. i have a sweet voice <laughs> um, from Dudley. how's can I swear? Yeah. Fuck do, off. <laughs> do whatever you like. Um, Dudley. He's so... Why are you so rude? <laughs> <laughs> I just got a double blast of Dom there. <laughs> why are you so rude? Down, boy. <laughs> anyway. There's a not, bowl of milk not, off screen. <laughs> yeah, there is. It's down there. Get on your knees. Um, so, 
That will happen after. Um, <laughs> we had an agreement, all right? We've lost track of yes, where we were. Yes, we have gone. Go, yeah. This is your fault. Yeah, fuck it. It's my show. <laughs> I'm actually a little bit scared right now. Okay, what were we talking about? Uh, we were talking about how um, you're, you're from Dudley. But <laughs> and what were we talking about before that? We were talking about how you got into do, uh, dom, domination, dominatrix this. Yes, so I met a woman who was doing it. I got yeah, into it Yeah, and you were on that. adult work for six years. Yes, I also involved myself in the kink scene. So I went to loads of parties, loads of clubs, went to munches, which are like kink meetups so you meet up in a pub because <laughs> if you go online you can find your local munch and you it's just normal people dressed in normal clothes on usually on a weekday you meet in the pub and you'll have a chat about how you're kinky and what you're into. <laughs> that is literally what it is so you just have a chat nothing happens you just... no you're in a normal pub so you go there have a drink meet like-minded people it's free and then mm. you have different ones, different ages. If you're straight, bi, man, woman, whatever your thing is, there's um, things if you're into bonded, things if you're into like a sub dom dynamic, anything really, you can search for it and you find it. London's amazing for that. If you want something, you will get it. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I just threw myself into that world. I was very sheltered before that but was really interested. And then without even really thinking about it, I did psychoanalyze everyone I've worked with and I still do it now. I find it incredibly interesting. I meet really people from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. I do work only with men, but all sorts of men, different ages, different backgrounds, ethnicities. What's, what's, what's your background? I'm Pakistani. So you're Pakistani. So you grew up in the Midlands, moved to London. Yeah, I moved uh, to London when I was 25. What was, so what, prior to getting into the work side of stuff, what was your, that's going to sound like an MOT, but what was like your sexual experience, sex, sexual history like? Limited. <laughs> yeah, okay. Very limited. I'd only been with one person. So I was incredibly sheltered. And I think when I look back on it quite, naive and just threw myself into this world but I've always been quite if, if I think about the last eight years I will just go to events by myself I will just set up a profile and invite a random submissive man <laughs> to my house and beat him up or tie him up and leave him um <laughs> just do it like if I want to try it I'll do it mm. so my experience was pretty much nothing um I knew nothing about the kink world and I taught myself as well. So right. no one really taught me how to be dominant. But because the first few clients that I had were really amazing and that my first ever booking, I actually had a guy come to my place in Brixton and he wanted to be... So I should give you the contest text. <laughs> yes, please He's... do. 60s i'm not going to tell you who he is yeah. but works as an opera critic for a leading paper has been doing it for a number of years yeah is very refined well spoken and contacted me online and said i have a thing where i want to be so this is where you'll learn what a pay pig is i want to be your pay pig and i want to be your submissive i want a woman who is very dressed very normal. I don't want you to wear any makeup. I want you to tie your hair back, wear jeans and a t-shirt. And I'd like us to have almost like a date first where we have champagne and chocolates and we talk to each other about classical music and current affairs. And right. I was like, yeah, great, I'll do that. So he sent me this very long email about what he wanted which was he would come dressed in his suit he'd bring some champagne and some fancy chocolates and whatever I wanted so I requested my favorite perfume right I was like, this is what I want this is what you're bringing and he comes to the house and the whole thing was that he would be dressed in this sissy outfit underneath his suit 
Okay. And he would have money hidden on himself. So in his socks, <laughs> in his shirt pocket, in his coat pocket, um, like really weird, like he'd attached it to the bottom of his shoe before he'd got there, like stuff like, he'd re- re- really thought about it and he'd sent me like a three page email about how he was controlled by his his bodily part, so his penis, and his penis was telling him that he should submit to a woman and give all his money to her. But only if she tries to take it, then she takes it and it's his fault. Right. So he rocks up. We have an hour of talking about classical music, current affairs, all the normal stuff. Yeah. Have a drink, eat some chocolates. Great time. Have the perfume. You're great. And then we... So he pays me for, we had, I think, three hours. Pays me for the three hours up front, always up front. And then we go into the role play, which is I'm going to ask him to take his clothes off and he will reveal this sissy maid outfit underneath. And I just want to mention, this is my first ever booking as well. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing this. And he will reveal this outfit and then... I will go head to toe and find the money on him and laugh in his face and be like, oh my God, you've got 50 pounds here. I'm taking that, you fucking piece of shit. That's for me. (laughs) Like, you're so stupid. You put money on yourself. It's mine now. So it's basically sexual mugging. Yeah, but he wants that. So imagine, I've never come across this before. So I'm like, does he want the money back at the end? Like, what's going to happen? Is this just part of the role play? Yeah. To start taking the money out, I go head to toe, pull it out the socks, start the coat pocket, bottom of the shoe, you know, get it all. As I take it all out, I'm like, ha, 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 ha. You're so stupid. Look at me. I've got all your money. You're worthless. You're being controlled by your fucking dick. And he's... The whole time going, I'm so stupid, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm stupid, I'm I'm foolish, you can take it all, you're the mistress. So I take all the money. He literally came without me doing anything, without him touching himself, nothing, from me taking his money. So, so he like physically came as in Yeah, so ninety I'd say ninety percent of my clients don't even have to There's no touching from... I don't touch people anyway there, but they don't touch themselves and they come from the fantasy that is happening right there. So, um, yeah, he came. But actually, I've missed out a crucial bit. Before that, I actually had to hit him. And I'm hitting him on the back with a cane on his bum. Yeah. And I start drawing blood. Now, there's always a safe word when you get into this yeah. kind of situation with anyone. So there's a safe word. I'm like, you, used to, you need to use the safe word if it gets too much, and then we both stop, and it's totally fine. But I'm hitting him, and I start drawing blood. Now, I've never done this before. So the lovely, caring, maternal side of me is like, oh, my God, you're hurt. <laughs> so I bend down. Are you okay? Is everything okay? You're bleeding. And he looks at me and he's just like, nothing. There's nothing in his face to say stop. But I'm, I again reiterate to him, you're bleeding. Are you okay? Do I need to get a cloth or something and clean yeah. this? And then he had to pull out of the fantasy and say, look, this is not what I wanted you to do. I would have used a safe word. You obviously don't know what you're doing. It's okay, I will help you out, I will teach you if we can carry on having this arrangement. You are actually really good, but you just need a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. So we then went back into the role play and he came and he was very happy, left me a really good review online. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we carried on having this relationship where it then went on to, if he would think about me, wherever he was, Mm. He would have to email me and then send me £50. What? Every time he thought about me, he would send me a long email saying, I'm very, very sorry, mistress. I've been a bad, bad boy. I thought about you. Um, I owe you money. 
here's this is incredible and send me money i had a money you have money that is sent to your account mm. online and so he had account details so every now and again i'd get like just a burst of money in my account <laughs> like, ah someone's been thinking about me again <laughs> can i uh, can 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 dudes be dominatrixes yeah of course they can all right we're gonna we're gonna talk after this because this, this sounds like the dream job you've got there's no sexual contact. You beat the fuck out of a couple of people, then you get paid some money. It's not the dream job. It's a lot of work. You have to be in a certain headspace to do it. Some what's the What's the headspace? Not yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I do that all the time. No, I'm a very caring, empathetic, kind person. With I'm very maternal more than anything else. Mm. So for me to do that role is out of my comfort zone so do you see it as like a job then yeah 100 percent a job i wouldn't do it if i didn't get paid no 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 no. obviously but as in like psycho like i i guess in your own head do you split it off as a job as in like this is a job or do you i guess what i'm saying is do you get off on it as well no no so it's, it's just the job it's purely work purely work oh that's interesting what's the dynamic like then has it affected your own like personal sex life yes so uh, the re- one of the reasons why I pulled away from it a year ago I'm now getting back into it but I felt like because I was being two different people I was the domination side of me was a total bitch right. who got what she wanted, demanded where to go, would send lists of things she wanted, would treat men like shit because they wanted me to. But you can't help but do that for six years and not take on part of that personality. Mm. So I felt like my personal relationships, I tried started treating men in a similar way. Um, and I'd become quite disposable of men. Right. So I was dating multiple people and I'd just kind of pick them up as and when I wanted and then drop them. And having that done to me the other way around is horrible. So I think I turned into someone who wasn't very kind for a while. Right. So that's one of the reasons why I pulled away. And I I was worried that it might be a barrier for me to have a relationship because I've been single the whole time I've done this. But what I realized was that there are a lot of people out there who are kink friendly, who are open, who are understanding. And for me, it is work. It has no sexual dynamic for me anyway. Obviously, it does for my clients, but I'm good at what I do. And that's why I'm starting again. So I pulled away from it to focus on other work stuff. But now I'm going to do it again. But of course, it has an impact on your mental your mental health and your state of mind in terms of like how you operate as a person because you walk out of there and then you're back to reality. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to do that. I think right. you've just been like beating someone up. <laughs> <laughs> and then you walk out and you're on the phone to your mum talking yeah. about mundane stuff and feelings and you don't really do that. But that being said, I've had clients who do end up having, I've had adult babies who've actually cried on me and then I've had to stop the session because I realise that there's something else going on there. So as much as they call you a pro dumb, that's what I would call myself, you end up being a bit of a therapist as well. And I think a lot of people's, I don't really like to say it, but some people's kinks are deep-rooted issues that they're trying to deal with. I think a lot of the time they're healthy and it's totally fine to have those things and it's all part of a healthy sex lifestyle. But I have had clients that I'm like, okay, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. Or when you have a pay pig who's spending all their money on you. and Do you have to be conscious of stuff like that? So let's say there's somebody that you know who's not as financially well-off. As like maybe so some other I clients. am conscious. I know other women who are not. I don't know whether you've read in the papers over the last few years, there's been a few guys who've um, become bankrupt yeah, yeah. and lost their houses and their family homes because 
as a financial dominatrix, you can demand money. Mm -hmm. So, and it is something where they feel compelled to pay you. So if you, I know a girl who literally asked someone to remortgage their house and he did for her. So I have never done that. I'm very conscious. I'm very aware that I don't want to be that person. Wow. So there's a limit to it. I've never been demanding. People have come to me asking to be that person. Mm -hmm. And so if they've come to me and I know that it's coming from, it's very consensual, they're not being driven by some deep rooted issues, then I'm, I will partake. Right. But I know that it's become really popular online. You can do it online, ladies, if you want to make some extra cash. <laughs> you see it. I see it on Tinder all the time. Yeah. Like when you're swiping, swiping through and stuff, you see it. Like they'll, they'll, they'll just be like a proper hot chick and you'd be like, oh, click on her profile. And then on the bottom is just like, if you want to talk to me, you got to send me something. And it's like PayPal. How much have you sent? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a working comedian, fam. I barely eat. <laughs> I haven't got disposable income. I'd be one of those people that had to like remortgage their like podcast like gear. <laughs> you know, I <laughs> can't afford that shit. But I, it, I can't, it's almost like a gambling addiction, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I, I'm quite aware of addiction and mental health i think i'm a very woke dominatrix (laughs) that's probably not the right thing to say but i'm very aware of other things that go on in people's lives including my own like i've suffered with my mental health on and off my whole life so i'm very aware that if something doesn't seem right or it doesn't seem safe that i don't want to be part of it Mm. And I think it's very easy to be sidetracked by the money because you get paid a lot of money per hour to just be like, fuck it, I'm going to take this work because this is my job to humiliate you. But I also have a heart. So uh, I'm very conscious of that. So I pulled away from a few clients, uh, the adult baby that I had who was crying. I then found out that his mum had recently died And that's why he wanted me to mother him. And so I told him, I gave him his money back and told him to go to um, therapy therapy and grief counselling. Yeah. That is, man. So essentially you've got like three or four jobs in one. Yeah. It's not just one thing. You end up, you end up meeting people and getting to know them. I had a client for five years straight who I know really well and I'm still friends with know each other you end up sharing yourself as well you can't pretend to be a person for that long so you learn each other's real names I well I did that you know exactly who you are what's going on in your real life um you can't help but build a relationship and Mm -hmm. an emotional connection with someone as well as a physical okay maybe not a normal physical one in terms of you're not having sex but you have that dynamic with each other. The almost like physical intimacy dynamic where you've seen each other naked or whatever the fuck. And yeah. Yeah, you kind of unveil yourself, I guess. And to, they're to at their people. most vulnerable when you see them. Me, not so much, but for you to, for a man to put themselves in that position, they're bearing their deepest, darkest secrets. And I do get a lot of um, South Asian clients as well. <laughs> So for them, I know that it's a massive thing to be letting on that they're submissive because I think within our community, it's very patriarchal. Do you have like one client that sticks out in your head the most, either through just sheer strangeness or like... Okay, I have a few. Okay, let's start with a lighthearted one and then we'll get heavier and heavier. (laughs) Okay, lighthearted one, 10 minute booking, but always charge for an hour regardless. Go to the hotel. These top tips there. Top tips. Always charge for the hour. You have to charge for the hour. It doesn't matter how long it is. You get there. There's three lemon meringue pies on the table. Doors (laughs) open. He's sitting in a chair. There's a Polaroid camera next to the table. There's the pies. Not to be eaten. (laughs) keep a straight face whenever I tell this story it never gets old um and then you take each pie and as much as you'd like to eat it you can't so you take the pie 
and you pie him in the face. <laughs> He's sitting on the chair. <laughs> you go, ha ha, you worthless piece of shit. And then you get another one, pie him again. Look at you. Look at you just sitting there all humiliated. And then you get the other one. Do the same. Take a picture. Leave the picture. Take the money. Leave. <laughs> oh, absolutely sensational. <laughs> sensational. And if you don't mind me asking, how much did you get paid for that? £200. Oh, man, I'd pay somebody in the face for free. They don't want you, though. Huh? They don't want you. No, they don't. Uh, fucking the hairy Asian man could, who'd actually kick the shit out of them. No. That's <laughs> they not want a good Asian girl who shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, exactly. I think that's most of the, the fantasy is that a woman who should not be doing something like yes. that. Yes, I think, I think that brings me on quite nicely to a question I actually did want to ask you. So the South Asian thing or the Pakistani thing definitely plays into... So I guess you do get fetishized. fetishized. Yeah, massively. And that's my niche. Sometimes it bothers me and then other times... I'm, like, I'm using it to my own advantage. <coughs> I don't do anything I'm not comfortable with. <coughs> I make the rules. If mm. I'm not happy with something, I leave. If I'm not happy with a client, I leave. Everything's on my terms. Have you had to leave before? A few times. Are you willing to share the reasons uh, why? Sometimes you meet people who have taken way too many drugs when you get there so they're not in their right minds and I don't really want to do that work for me is a complete sober space and then other times it's been um, they're not who they say they are so you're not comfortable what you, do you mean? I mean you, you get clients that say that they want to be submissive and then you get there and they're actually looking for an escort oh uh, okay a lot, a lot of I hate to say it, but a lot of South Asian guys that I meet think that that you're there to provide other services. So I've had to leave then. Then you get people that try and shortchange you. You always get the guy who wants a discount. <laughs> and it also happens to be the South Asian ones. No, that's all, all types of people try and give you, they give you the money and you count it and you're like, hmm, there's £30 missing. What do you do in those situations? Just leave. Oh, you just flat out leave? Yeah, or you get the, oh, I've left um, I left my bank card at home. I've only got a hundred pounds. Okay, bye then. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or someone stole my wallet on the way here. <laughs> like, no, now. I came here to steal your wallet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the wallet? <laughs> 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 just like look I bought my bally and everything where are we going like what are we doing <laughs> that'd be a wicked dom if she's dommed you before you've even realised she was the one that mugged you I mean, up, like, that... I've been mugged <laughs> here it is that has also been requested <laughs> <laughs> wait what <laughs> they've requested an actual mugging requested being um, I used to have this guy who used to fly in from Switzerland to Gatwick airport and then he wanted to be harassed at the airport by me. <laughs> <laughs> like sexy immigration. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. But basically just approaching him and starting an argument with him for no reason and humiliating him in front of loads of people and making wow. him out to be a creep or a pervert. Yeah. In, oh my god absolutely wow yeah jesus that sexy immigration is just gonna lift off watch you can coin that as well you've got the whole south asian dominatrix thing going immigration dominatrix i mean yeah that's a bit dark i mean that's just immigration that. isn't it they can pretty much do anything they want with you anyways yeah but there's you do get that whole fetish thing sometimes can get a bit murky like what's the weirdest fetish you've come across weirdest nothing's we weird nah like yeah i know i should probably like work my vocab in it well, i'm not the most woke of people you're, so it's you're like, clearly not but nah. it's okay like, um, I, I was i had one objective during this whole podcast that was not to kink shame and now i'm like openly like what <laughs> so i have no i don't think anything is weird everyone's entitled to enjoy what they enjoy i do have ones that i just find bizarre 
I find the food... Bizarre is just a, another name for weird. No, it's not. It's not... Okay, interesting. There you go. Interesting okay, go fetish. So, people have food fetish in terms of, right, they want to be force-fed. So, you put... I reckon I could get into this in... I could get into this fetish being force fed food. I mean, me too. <laughs> Maybe I should switch over <laughs> yeah. and do it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> eat this, you fat bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you, you're just eating two, two meals at Nando's, you fat pig. <laughs> I mean, I do that anyway. But um, yeah, so putting a mask on someone, having a funnel. And then oh. A f- pushing the food down the funnel and then forcing it down their throat. So they're not enjoying the food. They're just being forced to get... It's called... um, It's a feeder kink. So you're feeding someone to make them fat. Oh, I've read articles about women like that. Yeah. Women that men pay with these women to eat loads and then they get really fat. Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, if you want to get into that, that can be arranged. (laughs) No. (laughs) You're not going to get anything from me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I love eating. we we got some smosas here, that's what we've got. Develop oh, a smosa kink, I'll you, buy you smosas. You can feed me those later. <laughs> <laughs> I bought my funnel with me. <laughs> what get, get that mask out and that funnel out. Let's get it out. That on. would make a great fucking podcast. That would just be the whole trailer, me force feeding you smosas. Um... <laughs> You don't have to force me. I happily eat them of my own accord. Yeah, always make sure your smosas are consensual. Okay? Yes. Um, are there any legal ramifications to any of this? Let's say you're force feeding someone and they choke and they die. I've never really thought about that. Uh, that te- was the first thing. You, te- were, te- you were telling me about the funnel and thought that, that was the first thing that popped into my mind. Okay, what if they die? You can't actually... So in terms of... Pain and abuse, because it is abuse if you're hitting someone or dominating them. You can't actually consent to it. So it's not really something you should be doing. Wait, wait, sorry. Have you just confessed on air to being a rapist? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you can't consent. When someone asks you to do something to them, like hit them or tie them up, force feeding, I don't actually know the, the legalities of that. But you're not. If something happens to them, for example, then you would be, you're the one who's held responsible because you cannot consent to those activities. You can't use that as a defense. So mostly I try not to hurt people or kill them, etc. I know I shouldn't do about that. I mean, I'm I'm hoping (laughs) it's all the time I try not to kill them. No, I try, I'm very conscious that, Everything is safe, and I do very mild domination, and I'm not... There's women out there that do very intense things that I'm not willing to do because I want to stay safe, and I want to keep my clients safe, and safety is key. What kind of stuff? What do you mean? uh, As in, what kind of extreme shit do the other women do? Asphyxiation. Oh, yeah, that's dangerous. Um, Medical play, needles... Like cutting. Oh yeah. my god. <laughs> I'm, so yeah. Sad. I'm so glad you don't do any of that I shit. I don't do any of that. I never have. Because I've got like a real like paranoia. Did you read about that guy in New Zealand that claimed to have killed that woman during consensual sex? He like choked her and then she died. Yeah. I've got like a real thing because choking is such a big thing now. It's such a big thing now that women have it in their Tinder bios. Right? Like here. Uh, do they? Yeah, like there's that one there's a really popular phrase now which is like uh, I might like getting choked, but sea turtles don't. Uh, feminism. And like... <laughs> I don't know why I went for feminism there. And then um, I have this like real parent... Like, how far do you push it? I don't. No, 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 no. no. It's a rhetorical question. Like, how far do you push it? Because you don't want to be like a pussy when you're choking somebody, innit? Oh, my God. <laughs> Imagine you're like trying to choke somebody and they're just sort of sat there like, oh, this dude's just got his hand around my throat. What the fuck? I think if you've had a conversation and there's consent and you've got something in place to say it's too much, like tapping the other person, because they obviously can't speak most of the time. Yeah. I don't really know where I stand on that because 
there's a fine line between choking and then it's turning into something that's abusive or too much. So. Or murder. Or mur- there are people who... who yeah, that dude did get... Well, actually, that dude actually turned out that he basically killed her. He he definitely killed her. Because he got like, rid of the body. And then that same day that he got rid of the body, he um, went on another Tinder date. Okay, that's quite dark. I don't think that's really a question of whether choking should be. No, 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 because the, because the whole case actually came about because that was a conversation they were having, and then they found out like, oh no, this was probably actually just murder. And he like he he like googled about the ramifications before doing it. Like, oh, um, I don't know the specifics of it, but basically that ended up being murder. But then it did raise this whole debate on Twitter mainly, which is the best source for facts. Uh, about how like far you should push it. There's a bunch of people in this room looking at me right now. Like, what the fuck am I on about? Read your papers, all right, people. No, I understand exactly what you're saying, and I I know a lot of people who are into that. But if you're going to choke someone, then you need to deal with the legal ramifications if something goes wrong. If you're yeah. going to hurt someone, then you need to know what your there's a risk to it. So you're you're yeah. going into the risk fully knowing that something could go wrong. So then you can't pussy out of it and be like, oh, I didn't mean to kill her. <laughs> you got to take that murder charge on the chest, dog. <laughs> well, it'll probably be... So from a legal perspective, it would be manslaughter because you don't have the, oh, the, the mens rea there, so, which is the intent to kill. Whoa. I did a law degree. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Imagine going to prison for choking somebody during sex. Like that'd be the that'd be the worst crime to be in prison for. Like what were you in for, dog? Oh, murder. Oh, what'd you do? You stab somebody? What, you get in a gang fight? No, nah, man, just couldn't control my just couldn't control my hands during a sex. <clears throat> You'd be getting raped so fast in prison. <sighs> I feel like there's joking. there's people off camera laughing yeah, at that, right? I mean, <laughs> fuck you, huh? Oh, we don't joke about rape, but okay. Oh, you don't. I do. Okay, you do. Sorry, <laughs> I, I definitely do. So your law, de- your law degree. Yes. Uh, what was your background prior to dominate, dom- 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 dominating people? Um, I worked in a... I won't go too far into it, but in a corporate finance kind of background. Mm. And before that, I was at home looking after my family and my mum and my younger brothers in the West Midlands. What was home life like like during during the time you were growing up? Very, I had a very strict upbringing, very, even though I was raised by my mum, very patriarchal kind of misogynist kind of thing of, I'm from a Pakistani Muslim family and I wasn't religious and I said I was an atheist. So as you Ooh. can imagine, that went down great. Um, <laughs> but no, I I kind of listened to everything that my mum said and I, I was very, I guess, submissive <laughs> to the whole family lifestyle and looking after my mum and my brothers and being very maternal. Mm. I learned to cook from a really young age. Um, it was very studious. So my home life was... A bit crazy, but also I loved it. I loved growing up in a South Asian family, but I also had no brown friends because I grew up in a very white town and I actually hated being Asian when I was growing up. That was one of the things. Interesting. Because I didn't feel like, I didn't feel like I fitted in. Mm. I couldn't relate to anyone and I wanted to be like everyone else, but I was never going to be that person. I used to get picked on at school and told that I smelt like curry because Mm. I did. Um, (laughs) And yeah, it was an an interesting time, but it all molds you to who you are now. Yeah. And those same people are now probably trying to pay you to beat them up. Or to make them curry, because that is actually my other job. <laughs> I cook for well, a living. So, so what, what, what's your other job? I run a supper club, a Pakistani supper club. I've done it for two years now, nearly. Um, we do a Pakistani supper club, so five-course vegan dinner with stories. So each course comes with a story of culture, heritage, my mum's background, my grandma, me, 
what it was like growing up in the West Midlands and being the only brown girl. Mm. Um, talking about the food, the memory attached to the food, the history of the food, bringing people together around a table that wouldn't ordinarily meet. Yeah. People buy a ticket to the event and they come and sit down and I usually relay loads of my funny stories about my various jobs that I've done. And I do a lot of private dining. So recently it's just like private events, like anniversaries and birthday dinners. Yeah. So very intimate private dining or fresh or from scratch. South Asian recipes or passed down from my grandma to me. Mm-hmm. So that's the other job. So I do get paid to feed people. Oh, wow. This yeah. is, have you ever thought about tying the two together? So, yeah, supper club? so next month we're doing kink-based. So because I'm in the kink community, I want people to feel comfortable in their own selves and come around the table. And if they want to be dressed up as an adult pet, they can do that. If they want their sub dom dynamic at the table, they can do that. Um, you buy a ticket for the dinner, you come along, you meet like-minded people and everything that happens there, the discussion, there's no play, Mm -hmm. the discussion and your persona stays there and it's all confidential and a safe space for you to be in. Because I think when you're in that community, you can go to either a club where you're fully yourself and it's usually more of a play kind of party vibe, or you go to, for example, a munch where you can't be fully yourself, but you socialize with people. Hopefully this will be a space where you can socialize and be yourself, but there's not that pressure of you having to go hard or go into character, you know, go into party mode or we're going to have a play session or whatever. It's just right. a place where you can have a really banging dinner <laughs> and be yourself yeah. and have uh, someone who is hosting it, me, who is non-judgmental, opening and welcoming, and you can just meet other people and be be totally yourself. Awesome. How did you? So, are your family aware of your lines of work? They are now. Um, so, I did a I did a panel discussion in March at the first Asian Women's Festival in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. And it was the first one, I don't know if you've heard about it, that was, it's set up by Shani Danda, who's like a disability activist and all sorts of other things. She's an amazing South Asian woman from the Midlands. And I actually contacted them because I could see that they were doing, it was a one day festival fighting stereotypes and stigma and taboos in the South Asian community things like mental health, sexuality, um, domestic violence. Sounds like a well-known popular podcast. Yes, it, <laughs> it does. Uh, there was food there, there was entertainment there, there were stores, workshops, talks, like incredible women talking about how they were pushing boundaries, artists, musicians, workshops on things like finance and sexuality. But the sexuality one, I was part of so I spoke about what I was doing but the funny thing is that prior to that my mum had no idea so I've always kept this a secret because it's something that I don't really want to shout from the rooftop around my family Mm. but um, my mum dropped me to the venue massive hall in Birmingham and I'm sitting outside in the car park and she says I'm coming in I went, no, you're not. You're not coming in. She went, yes, I am. Your brother said that you're doing a talk today and I want to hear what you're talking about. Is it about your supper club business? (laughs) And I said, no, it's about relationships. (laughs) Loose term. I said, it's about relationships. And she said, what kind of relationships? You don't know about that. You're not married yet. (laughs) <laughs> because if I'm not married then I obviously have n- had no kind of contact with that world you know and I said actually it's more about sex and relationships and it's actually me talking about myself as well and my exploration of what happened when I moved to London she said well what happened 
And I need to go in in five minutes and start this talk. So I'm looking at my mum and I'm like, this is not the time for me to tell you. And you absolutely, categorically cannot come inside and listen to this talk because you may have a heart attack. <laughs> and I really don't want to do that right now. And she refused. She said, I'm coming in. So at that point, I realised I had to tell her because really don't want her to have a heart attack in the audience so rather have it in the car so <laughs> I said to her I said oh I've not been honest about the work that I've been doing whilst I've been away I have so sorry we had to pause uh, our video we started having like some technical issues that we had to sort out uh, so just to recap you were with your mum in the car you've just told her that you are a dominatrix yes and she asked me if I wore a PVC cat suit whilst I worked. That was the first thing she said to me. That was the only question she the had. The reaction was that. And then she told me that she'd watched a documentary on Channel 4 about doms and that's what they all wore. So that's mu that must be what I was wearing too. Right. And I explained that I didn't do that and that I was the girl next door dom. So I just turned up in my normal clothes and then I looked at her and I said, are you not shocked? Are you not angry? And she said, sometimes you do things that you shouldn't do to get you where you are right now. And you seem to be doing all right right now. So. And this is a full on traditional from Pakistan. Woman. My mum is very old school. Yeah. Very traditional. She shocked me. Like, Did you ever ask like how, why, how or why she was so accepting? Well, I think because I've always been very caring and loyal to my family and always I've always put them first that my mum also my mum knows that I'm not an angel I think deep down she knew that there right. was something there she just likes to put on the act that I'm the good girl mm -hmm. I am a good girl <laughs> um and then she basically she was like let's go in then so she came in I did the we walked around the center looked at some art had some food, walked around the stalls, and then I did this panel discussion where I got asked questions and I did some speaking. And she just sat and listened. And then at the end, I had a few really lovely girls who were like, can we come and talk to you and ask you some questions? Can we talk to your mum? Yeah. Because I told, part of the story as in the talk was I've just told my mum in the car park. Right, okay. Age 32. Uh, I was so terrified and we should all be a bit more open with our parents and they're not, they're people that do know about sex and relationships. So yeah. just, just try, like try and start that conversation and it shouldn't take you that long. It took me to get to 32 to talk about that. Mm. So it was really liberating because I had a few young women saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to tell my mum tonight that. I actually like men and women and you've made me feel like I can do it, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. And then they spoke to my mum at the end. They were like, you must be proud of your daughter. She's so amazing. And I was just standing there going, oh my God, what is <laughs> Don't happening? Don't start that conversation. Don't do that. <laughs> um, but I, sp I spoke about the dominatrix stuff, my food stuff. I have other work that I do, so... It was a really interesting conversation and my mum was amazing and I remember hugging her at the end and being like, thank you so much, you're mm. great. So I'm very lucky. What about what about your brothers? So you've got a couple of brothers, do they know? Not the full extent, no. Oh, okay. No. Well, let's, hope, it's, it's let's not, hope they don't see this. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, if they did, I wouldn't be like, the end you know, of the world. I'm not worried. My brothers are very, I'm very lucky that they're very ex accepting of me just in general. I've always been outspoken. I've always stood up for myself and stood up for being a woman and having my own voice and not listening to what other people want, like expect of me. And there's this whole idea of shame in the family and I'm like, fuck that, I'm not doing that. If people don't like me, whatever. I know that I'm a good person and mm. they've... They've always supported me in that. So So what about with the wider community then? Wider community is very traditional in terms of family. So they don't really know, but that's because I don't really speak to them. Oh, okay. And I'm trying to connect with more Asian people now that I live in London and make 
more I call it family like if I meet new people new friends make yeah. an extended family and share with those and get, I'm what's amazing is that I'm starting to meet people at various nights and events who are pushing the boundaries and smashing stereotypes and fighting the stigma and the taboo subjects. So I don't feel like I'm alone anymore, yeah. including you guys. <laughs> so that's, I think that's the key thing, like pushing forward, like speaking up more, not hiding away. And the more we talk about it, the further we're going to progress. Mm. Because we need to talk about it. If we don't talk about it, yeah. just be I hate this whole idea that you brush everything under the carpet I don't want to do that yeah for, um, for like research purposes and I, I totally agree with you like 100% I think the more you start delving into like your own community you kind of realise like oh my god there's so many different like people with different lives like one of the things that we've really been trying to focus on is like sex workers mm -hmm. so I literally went onto Twitter and I typed in Indian porn star and oh my god, there's so many with like OnlyFans accounts, mm. all sorts. And I was like, literally, I was blown away. I never thought there'd be so many um, people. Are you sure you've never done that before? <laughs> no, I generally never have. Uh, <laughs> oh dear God. <laughs> no, gen generally, like, really speaking, it's amazing. And yeah, I, I think you're right. We do need to start like talking about it. And it's fucking interesting. It is interesting. Not not even just the stuff that's been on air, even the like conversations in and around. I I I'm mind blown. Like your experiences, your stories and shit, absolutely incredible. What's like the funniest story? Last one. What's the funniest dominatrix story you've got? <laughs> um, my actually one of my favorite and most memorable stories is this is quite early on. A guy who invited me round to his house and he said he had a wrestling fetish. If he got you to dress up as The Undertaker, oh my God. Now, as a child, I was obsessed and slightly still am. At the time, it was WWE. Yeah. It's now WWF, I think. I think it's the other way around. Isn't it? Is it's it? the other way around. It was yeah. WWF and now yeah, it's WWE. Yeah, yeah. But I was obsessed with wrestling. I've been raised with boys. Anything to do with like submission holds, I'm your girl. Yeah. Which is really handy when you get someone <laughs> contact you asking... To be put in a submission hold. And I'm like, I know them all. <laughs> like, the Undertaker's my mate. I know all these things. So we have this conversation. And he's like, I will be dressed in a leotard. Um, could you also come dressed in some sort of wrestling gear? And I was like, yeah, if you pay for it, fine. I rock up to this house, which is probably still decorated like it's in the 80s walk in the man's about nearing 70 i'd say tall very skinny bold opens the door in like you know that borat outfit <laughs> the mankini the ma basically a mankini but with a little bit more going on here and i'm like i can see way too much right now not what i expected very scrawny and I go into the house and he's like, by the way, I've got some videos. I've got something playing whilst we get into this session. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got a VHS player and the tape is 80s women's wrestling with the perms yeah. and the lycra. And we had that on in the background. Uh, and then we started wrestling. <sighs> Absolutely uh, sensational. Did, um, a few different submission holds and then finally one just really got to him and he came in his mankini mankini absolutely phenomenal i never i don't think i'd ever regret asking you to tell a story ever i think this has just been mind-blowing i'm i mean there's many more There'll be a part two. I think we're out of time now, but no, thank okay. you for coming on. No, thank you for having me. There will me. definitely be a part two at some point, 100%, I can guarantee you that. Uh, we'll link you. all your socials and everything, anything you want in the description below. So go check V and her workout and her supper club. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>